Very, this it sounds like it's something that has to be highly automated and not something that you rely on. You can't have some bloke to be, sort of to be tweeting. Going, so that, oh, we've got a bus coming now. We've got a yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So. Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. This week I'm joined by Ian Morris from Light Reading. Hello. He's sort of rubbing your forehead as if you're dreading the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a special guest this week. We've got William Webb, who is a telecoms consultant and general all-round expert. And Excellent. extreme cyclist, as we're about to find out as well. Uh, so this week we will be talking, it's going to be quite buzzwordy. We're going to be talking about 5G and IoT and the new Apple iPhone. And just to remind you that if you're watching this on the website or on Facebook, you can also listen to it on SoundCloud or iTunes. And if you listen to it, you can watch it on the site or on Facebook. OK, so um, yeah, 5G, as well as that being something that, William, you're obviously at liberty to talk about at great length, it happens to be something that's been quite newsy this week. So, Ian, we've had um, NWC Americas kicking off, mm -hmm. and pretty yeah. much everyone. I think it's been quite comically transparent how everyone's desperately trying to one-up each other on their announcements leading up to this thing, Yeah, especially in the area of, quote, firsts. Yeah, and it's all become a bit underwhelming as well, I think, now, because um, we were aware that Verizon was going to you know, announce a, a tr try and launch fixed wireless access services based on 5G yeah. this year. So it's they don't of, call it that, do they? They've got some I don't know what they call it now, but they're just sort of attaching de firmer dates to things and it's all yeah. becoming a bit um it's all becoming a bit boring and, and incremental. And, and incremental and I think, you know, this probably gets back to what you guys were talking about to some extent last week when Ray was talking about this idea of the 5G jigsaw and all the different yeah. components that go with 5G and the stuff that we're hearing coming out of America is really it's just the sort of surface level radio stuff a lot of it I find that right. kind of there's still a big question mark, I think, attached to 5G in, in terms of how revolutionary it's really going to be. And, right. um, you know, there's still, I mean, there's tweets going out this week from kind of quite prominent uh, venture capitalists, I noticed in um, California saying, well, it just seems like, you know, the next step in the in the cycle, really. It's not, yeah. um, everybody's, everybody's trying to make 5G out to be something more significant and they're desperate for it to be that yeah. kind of revenue and, generator. And it was ever thus, I think. And, you know, I mean, both of you two have been part yeah. of this particular business longer than I have, but even yeah. my recollection or anecdotal knowledge is that 4G, 3G, there's always this every <clears> new <throat> decade, every new cycle, this overhyping. Yeah, I mean, I think it has the potential to be something more, obviously, yeah. when it comes to moving beyond a lot of the stuff that's being talked about in America, which is residential broadband and, and mobile services on smartphones. Yeah. Further on, you know, an area that William knows a lot mm. about, it, it does have the potential to play in areas like IoT and um, yeah. take operators into that, 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 you know, entirely new markets potentially and open up opportunities there. But I, I still think it's... There's a big question mark over whether it will do that, and and whether it's needed even, or whether other technologies can fill that role. So, William, passing it over to you, yeah. 5G is it all a load of bollocks? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think it's what's crystallising out now is there's some element of it that's useful for for more capacity. So, mobile operators, places like the UK, they've brought a 3.4 gigahertz spectrum. They'll probably roll that out on their city centre cells where they're struggling for capacity. And you know, they could deploy 4G, but why not use 5G? It's slightly better, it's slightly different. Um, so you can Slightly see better isn't a great marketing term, No, it? it's not. Um, and in terms of capacity, it's fractionally better from a spectrum efficiency point of view than 4G, not a lot really. So you're not gaining very much. I kind of liken it a bit to, to 4K TV. So you know, a lot of people have probably got a 4K TV, not because they want a 4K TV, it's just that every TV you buy now is 4K yeah. capable just and you get that kind of for free. And it sort of feels a bit like that with 5G for capacity enhancement. The mobile operators need to capacity enhance, they'll put in 5G capable base stations because why not? They're not that much more than 4G. Eventually phones will come out that have 5G in them. Yeah. And you know, that'll just be the default in, in the same way that you can't buy a phone now that hasn't got 4G, you won't be able to buy one that hasn't got 5G. In. Yeah, it'll all just kind of happen for capacity enhancement, but but that's not very exciting, as you said. That's just no, and kind that of doesn't drive sales in in the in the short term. I suppose when they start sort of banging on like they are in the US about five G, and isn't it all exciting? They're they're targeting among consumers. They're targeting the early adopter market, presumably. I I guess so, and and that's what I kind of I can't really get my head around why the operators think that being perceived as being a first in 5G is such a huge advantage because 
know, most people I talk to don't really care that much. And the, the general view is, well, that's all well and good, but can't you fix 4G first? Can't I have decent right. 4G coverage? That has been said. And if you look at what happened in in 4G, EE led that in the UK, yep. and yet it didn't really but get, gain them anything much. They made a big song and dance about being first to 4G yeah. and fastness and everything else. And everyone moaned about them being able to refarm their spectrum. Yeah. Else could. Did, did they see any bump in... Um, because I, I, I know there's a big question mark over things like ARPU. Very people are very yeah. sceptical that it will lead to more spending. Yeah. But is there an argument that, um, with all, the, especially in America, with all the intense marketing that goes on, and operators have tended to market on the basis of speed, and they're like labels like yeah. 3G and 4G that the uh, the people who launch it first will be able to win business and attract new customers, and you'll get the people who, in the same way that people rush out to buy 4K TVs that they, yeah. or 8K TVs that they yeah. might not really need, they still do it anyway because they like the idea of having the latest greatest mm. device. I, I mean, is that there's no evidence that I've seen that shows that that's actually significant. Yep. And of course, a lot of people are tied into one year, two year contracts on their mobile phones anyway. So if one operator comes out, let's say six months before another, then they're only going to grab at best the, those subscribers whose subscription comes up for renewal during that six month period and to a geeks and see some sort of benefit in, in that kind of thing. And I think that's such a small amount of people. Yep. It's is, hard is to Is anything going to tap 5G at first? Is so it going to? Is so anything like, going to take advantage of 5G yeah. services? I mean, yeah. Um, also, it'll be enhanced mobile broadband, fast, which is just sort. You could just how say, fast can you load? Something so you know, in the generations, phone? Pierre, they, they've tended to go, especially in, in the industry, they'll say they have 4G, and then to try and signify something that's significantly better, but not yet 5G, they'll go 4.5, yeah, yeah. 4.75, 4.9 recurring. Yeah. yeah, and you know, you could argue that 5G is just going to be 4.9 recurring, i.e., incremental gains using more technology like. Yeah, massive MIMO or, or carrier aggregation which has been around for a little while and all these sorts of things but um, you know one thing that's supposed to be unique about 5G is that it's using a bunch of spectrum that 4G would never use so anything above about but what does that mean for the consumer what well, means more a fatter pipe basically although those more bandwidth those oh. very high frequency bands the sort of 26 gigahertz and above they're not really being targeted at smartphones are they aren't there still question marks over, over yeah. whether you can actually yeah. use that in a smartphone yeah. because you even your hand could be a barrier to the signal Ab absolutely yeah. so i think it's it's often the sort of fixed wireless access that those get associated with isn't it that, that's that's right i haven't seen anybody really who's got a, a, anything like a sensible plan for millimeter wave those high frequencies yeah. to the handset although there's been a, some chips announced from Qualcomm and others that will do it but as you said getting your hand in the way putting any kind of case on your phone um, and in, indeed you know even holding your phone horizontally is not a good idea because you need the aerials to be <sighs> vertical right. but actually of course almost always people do hold their phone horizontally yeah. because most people use their phone for browsing and tapping the, the exactly. top of it when you hold it horizontally. So you're going to be instructed to take the case off your phone, yeah. not hold it in your hand, or at least if you do hold it with your two fingers just to one side and hold it vertically, <laughs> and then you can get this wonderful new service. It doesn't sound particularly attractive. And then, and then one thing... Use tweezers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one one uh, attempt at objection handling with, with millimetre wave and higher frequency I've heard is, is people talking about beamforming and how that beamforming will go some way to counteracting these negative propagation mm. characteristics that you were just describing. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about beamforming and whether yeah. or not they're talking rubbish? So in principle, it's a great idea. And it's the idea that basically, instead of having a base station that's kind of like a light bulb and just radiates energy in all directions, you have a base station that's more like a torch and points a narrow beam at yeah. individual subscribers. At my phone. Yes. It just follows me around. Exactly. Like, like the eye, eye of Sauron. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that makes a lot of sense from a theoretical point of view, <laughs> even if it doesn't yeah. necessarily from a uh, Lord of the Rings <laughs> point of view. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and and that's because, as you said, you can get both greater range. And also, cleverly, you can then have multiple beams pointing at different subscribers all in the same cell. As long as they don't overlap, mm. then you can really improve the capacity. So theoretically, fabulous. Practically, very, very hard to do. You'd think so, wouldn't so you? So the first problem you've got is trying to find this, this subscriber. So it's a bit like the trying to find the bomber with a searchlight kind of function. Right. You can hear it somewhere up there. But until you actually spot it, 
you've got no idea where. So all you can do yeah. is shine that searchlight randomly around the sky. So that sounds inefficient. So that's the problem in the first place. And then you find the subscriber and then a bus gets in the way and suddenly you've got to redirect the antenna right. to pick up a reflection off a building and then the bus gets out the way <laughs> and then the subscriber's moved. And the whole thing is very, very difficult to imagine working effectively yeah. in is city centres. Is it going to be very... This It sounds like it's something that has to be highly automated and not something that you rely on you can't have some bloke to be, sort of to be tweeting so that, oh, we've got a bus coming Adam. now. We've got a <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so you'll need to have... Like a stage also, light. All sorts of clever algorithms to do that. Yeah. And the work on those have only just started so right. it's a, lo a long way off so okay. so it's tricky stuff um, and actually beamforming is also proposed even at the three and a half gigahertz frequencies right. the ones that were auctioned recently for just the same reasons that um, they don't go as far as existing frequencies that are used for 3g and 4g but the mobile operators don't really want to have to put in lots of extra base stations to use these frequencies they'd like to just put the base stations uh, the, the new frequencies on the same base stations. Right, the big macro so to get the range up, they're using beamforming, which concentrates the energy. Um, but they're not going for really narrow beams initially. They're going right. for sort of slightly like broader beams. Yeah. yeah. So the hope is that actually that's not quite so hard to handle as the, the narrower beams. But it still remains to be seen quite how effective those so are. So maybe three and a half gig will be the sort of testing ground, given that we're not yeah. really talking about beamforming in normal licensed frequencies, even up. You know what is it? I mean, some UK operators got like what two point six, is it? Yeah, that's about the as high as it goes in that normal is. license, isn't it? That is. So we're not even talking about that there. So maybe when you're just jumping up another gig, that's where they're going to test out some of this stuff. Yeah. And it sounds to me, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that beamforming as a sort of practical in vivo thing is is still a bit of a long way away from yeah, happening. I think that's exactly right. That you, know, you can make it work in a lab. You can make it work in an open field that's all fine. Can you make it work in central London with all the different movement that's going on, with all the different issues taking place, with people popping in and out of buildings, all those other kind of things happening hasn't been tried yet. And it, if you look back at new technologies that were proposed for, say, 4G, it often took five years or so to really get yeah. them to, to be optimised and work well because you had to build up a lot of experience. And as you did that, the loading on the network built up anyway and things changed. And so I think it will be quite some time before these things really settle down and, and become really workable. So it sounds increasingly like, in the short term, 5G is bollocks. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, don't know if I'd, I don't know if I'd say it's bollocks, but right. I think it's been... One bollock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's to be expected, I suppose, that it's been overhyped and um, the industry's desperate to find the next big thing and yeah. 5G sort of seems to serve that purpose. It's but I don't think G. it's pointless yeah. for some of the reasons that William was saying. It is... Um, it is more. It might not be vastly more efficient, but it is more efficient. And if yeah. you have to build new equipment and yeah. roll out new software, then it's like when you go and get your car and you have the MOT done, you you get the latest wing mirror or the latest tyres. You don't buy something that's been sitting around in the in yeah. the garage for. You think while well, I'm here, I might so yeah. if it's not going to be that much more expensive, it yeah. And Do you think that's it. There's a lot of just future. I mean, if we I, accept I, that 5G, that all this stuff. I mean, there's so much momentum, so much R and D, so much consensus behind it that it is inevitable yeah and it's just a matter of when you start getting on with what's inevitable well, I think it's like as journalists mm. you're always looking for headlines aren't you and the marketers in and operators are always looking for snappy phrases to come out with and at the end of the day it's just the next st stage in the process really I suppose and you know if you go to trade shows and you hear the CTO speak they come out with things that don't sound very exciting at all like they don't even think it's going to drive up capital expenditure because they'll just you know as, as you were saying they'll use it at first in urban areas it's not going yeah. to be blanketing a country with 5g and a huge splurge on investment which would be the sort of thing that ericsson and nokia and you know huawei would love obviously it's mm. going to be quite a slow sort of yeah. process and it ties in very much with 4g in, in areas that aren't densely populated and where there isn't a capacity crunch but but in terms of that the thing that everybody wants to hear about 5G is that it's going to open up opportunities in some of these other, you know, vertical markets yeah. as they get Yeah, well, we're going to get onto IoT yeah. and stuff. Which is IoT. Minute. Now, yeah. that's yeah. further on, and whether it, I don't know, there's still doubts about that from some quarters, I know. So no. so before before we go there, William, I'm, I'm curious to know, so, you know, you act as a consultant, so you'll be having conversations that people wouldn't have with us journalists, mm. uh, because they don't assume that you're going to go straight onto the next I, uh, next uh, podcast and start banging <laughs> on about it. But within the, obviously, the confines of what you're professionally, mm. what is discreet for you to talk about, are there any particular areas, specifically for now, around 5G that you find uh, sort of coming up, sort of queries in, in, in the industry um, right now that you can share with us? So I think that the big question at the moment relates to 
to spectrum, how much do you really need, how's it got to be packaged? And, and that's because a number of governments are auctioning or just have auctioned the what's often thought of as the main band for, for 5G, the 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz band. And there's all sorts of different approaches being adopted to that. So here in the UK, we've auctioned off the lower half, we've still got the upper half to go. Yep. Uh, in Germany, for example, they're just looking at whether they should hive off a quarter of the band for industrial applications and uses there. Right. And then there's a, a question around, should operators really have one big contiguous chunk, often they yeah. talk about 100 megahertz, to be able to put in one really wide channel to get really high data yeah. rates? Is that important, or actually is it sufficient to have bits and pieces here and there? So I've definitely heard arguments up? for the former. Yeah. That almost some people saying there's no point in just... Um, auctioning off that 3.4 to 3.8 band in, in bits and bobs, you need to give operators a chance to get a big contiguous, let's say at least 50 megahertz chunk or up to 100 because then you can get that fat pipe thing. Do you, do you, do you agree with that or do you think there's, do you see both sides of that argument? So I can see that the need for wanting something a bit different because if you're going to do 5G, you could argue, and if you wanted to be anything more than just a bit more capacity, then, then, then do something that's a bit different and a big yeah. channel would make sense. But actually, it sort of comes then back to does the consumer actually need it? So if you have this yeah. 100 megahertz channel, you can deliver many hundred megabits a second of data. That's great, but is there actually much of a demand for that? And if you want to do that, it starts to get quite complicated in the ways you've got to arrange the spectrum, or at least you've got to, if you've got four operators and you want to give them all 100 megahertz each, and you've only got 400 megahertz, then clearly there's only one way you can do it. Yeah. Um, that means you've you've got to be somewhat prescriptive about your auction formats. And for example, here in the UK, that wasn't the case. And so the operators have got sort of 40 or 50 megahertz That's chunks right. of the lower block. And then there's a question around what they do in the upper block. Are you going to allow them to Quite. aggregate it all together and so on? Well, what was the reason, just butting in, but what mm. was the reason for not auctioning that upper block at the same time? Is it being used? Is it not sort of ready, re as readily available? Or? Yeah, it was, actually, it was actually somewhat historic, actually. Right. So... Um, in fact, Ofcom auctioned off two chunks of spectrum simultaneously, a small amount of 2.3 gigahertz, which O2 ended up acquiring the whole lot, and then the lower half of this 5G band. And actually, both of those bands were freed up by the MOD. So they kind of came to Ofcom at the same time some years ago. And Ofcom sort of said, well, you know, that's great. We've got these two bands. Let's get on and, and get them out there. And then that took a long time. There was various litigation and other such things um, through that process. And during that that process, it became clear that 3.4 to 3.8 was actually a, you know, one big contiguous band. And a number of people, me included, did say to Ofcom, actually, you know, why don't you, you pause here and do the whole of 3.4 to 3.8 in one go, because that makes a lot more sense. But Ofcom were very keen to get this auction done and out of the way. They'd already started the process many years back. Right. They worried that if they stopped that process or changed it, that that would open up all sorts of avenues for further legal challenge, yeah. which like, understandably they were people pretty like fed up with. People like me and Ian would take the piss out of them. Yeah. yeah. Their feet. So yeah. It's kind of, it was kind of an accident of history in a way. Um, but it does yeah. mean does leave a question mark around what to do with the upper bit. Yeah. And it does leave the operators, you know, both in the UK and other countries, sort of wondering what their right strategy is for all of that sort of thing. And, and because they don't really know what this is going to be used for, they don't quite know how the kits are going to arrive. They don't quite know how the antennas are going to perform. They don't know whether aggregating different carriers together is going to be feasible with beam forming antennas and all this other kind of stuff. There's a lot of uncertainty around all of that at the moment. Is, is there any thought on, I mean, this is getting into the IoT area, mm. but on, on which spectrum would be used to support different types of service? I mean, IoT, a lot of the stuff seems to get associated with the lower spectrum bands, I guess, because of the coverage qualities and you don't need very fast speeds. Yeah. But are they thinking about using those 3.4 to 3.8 in those? Uh, Not for IoT, no. Yeah. So, so actually, IoT in a way is one of those. <clears throat> we're allowed to move on to IoT. We're to, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll let I'll, it happen. And I'll blend it seamlessly for cool. 5G. <laughs> uh, so, of course, within 5G, there's kind of the three big services that have been quoted for a long time enhanced mobile broadband, which is kind of what we've been talking about up till now. Um, IoT, which is called massive machine communications, because yep. they couldn't just call it IoT because that would be boring. Or oh, isn't it machine type <laughs> communication? Sometimes, although that was sort of MMTC. Back, yeah, I still see that. There's no end. Small of M, big MTC. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then this, then this ultra low latency stuff, which we haven't talked about yet, yeah. and hopefully won't. There's, get a, there's to. a sort of overlap there. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Guess, so. There's some. But yeah, those um, are the three the cardinal yeah, points. So if, you, so if you look at um, the IoT element what the standards body 3GPP have decided is they won't do anything on that basically so they're simply going to take 
the existing cellular IoT standard, which is, well, there's two of them, but the, the main one probably is narrowband IoT or MBIoT, which yeah. is you know, very much part of 4G. And there's also something called LTEM, LTE for yeah. machines, which is equally very much part of 4G. Yeah. And those will simply be badged 5G. They won't be changed apart from the, the, the general evolution that takes place in all of this stuff over time. Yeah. But essentially, it'll be exactly those technologies that will be. And are they going to like sideline stuff like LoRa and Sigfox and all that? So that's a really. Ian's our Sigfox expert. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really interesting question. And that, that comes to, to a point that I think we're sort of working our way up to, which is will the mobile operators be able to make a good business case from IoT? So. On the one hand, um, I've seen, for example, that you can now buy a SIM card, which is NB-IoT capable, which has 10 years lifetime on it and comes preloaded with 500 megabytes worth of data right. for 10 euros. That is more than enough for most machines, most sensors. So they're just sending tiny little yeah. bits. So, so that's, they, they won't send 500 megabytes in their entire lifetime no. because they're only sending a few What would you say bytes. would be a typical for a sensor sending a little bit of what it sensed? Yeah. Is it like literally bytes 10 to 50 bytes if you right, um, okay. of, of data and they might so do 500 that. 500 mega is 500 million not even yeah. kilobytes wow. not even kilobytes no yeah. and actually if this stuff is battery powered then every bit you send is a bit closer to death literally yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's so you're going to be sparing you're very very sparing so so here you go you've got a a, a thing and um it's arpu is 10 euros over 10 years which is eight euro cents a month yeah, eight cents a month. I mean, that yeah. is You've got to tiny. Flog a lot of them for it to exactly count, and and just the cost of putting that on your system is yes. probably more than eight cents. <laughs> so unless the operators can, as they keep talking about, move up the value chain mm. and do something at the higher tier, then it's difficult to see what the really strong motivation for IoT will be for them. And I think that brings us on to the topic we are heading for: is can the operators do that? Can they deliver? Yeah automotive services or agricultural services or something that's more than just that and I, th I think history suggests no they whenever right. they've tried to do video calling yeah um, uh, location-based services wall garden internet widgets that was their take on um, apps yeah um, and, and so on but they're not, not very good outside of their good. core competence no. no I was just chatting to uh, Jamie who's over in Amsterdam at a trade show called IBC which is a broadcasting but obviously, there's there's distinct overlap between telecoms and broadcasting, i.e., airwaves for yes. starters. Um, and he was having a little chat with me about, um, a, in advance of a story he wrote about um, Nokia bailing out of a, a sort of video mm. transmission thing they mm. were doing, and then Ericsson's been trying to get out of its sort of TV video stuff for a while. And we were just concluding that these two big vendors, they both tried to diversify in that area for reasons that probably perfectly sound yeah. like we were just saying. You know, if we can already handle telecommunications, why can't we handle broadcast? Um, but they just couldn't do it. Mm. And they both just bailed out. Um, so that seems to be further anecdotal evidence of that confirms your point that the operators, they're perfectly good at providing us with bandwidth for our mobile yeah. devices, but much else. Yeah, not so much. No, and and, you, and indeed, you know, hats off to them. They're superb at that. So, over the years, we've gained data volume from a time when sixty-four megabits was a was a really big data subscription package to a time now when it's unlimited and you can send lots of gigabytes. And the and the price has gone down. So, in terms of delivering raw bit pipe services to consumers, they've done fabulously well. And and that really is a core strength of theirs. And they'll do that fabulously yeah. well, I'm sure, into the future. But when they try and move outside of that space, quite understandably, it gets very, very difficult. And, and you see that in almost every industry. Anyone trying to diversify struggles. Yeah. Do you, Indeed. Do you see them, uh, generally speaking, trying to, to move up the value chain, though? Because I guess if they're not going to make money, much money from doing uh, NBIoT yeah. just as a connectivity service, it doesn't give them a strong incentive to get these networks rolled out. And yet companies like Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom seem to be making quite a big deal about, about that. Yeah. So is it... The, you know they the, they have to kind of move up the value chain change just to justify the reasons for doing it I guess to some extent they they do and I see them making lots of noises at places like conferences yeah but I just don't see how they can so let's say let's take agriculture you know we've heard the smart cow is like one of the classic kind of anecdotal IOT services slightly more plausible than the smart fridge um, but still a, <laughs> a good bust of many jokes which, which says something <laughs> about the smart fridge that yeah. smart cow is more plausible yeah um, now you're a farmer you want a solution to have 
connect to issue with your cow so you can tell whether they're ill or whether they need milking or whatever it might be. Yeah. You're not going to go to Vodafone and just say, please send me 50 tags. You're going to go to John Deere and say, please sell me the complete package. Um, I need the software mm -hmm. for my PC. I need all these tags enabled. I need the back end system that does the data analytics to tell mm -hmm. me when a cow is ill. Um, I want you to give me sort of best practice across all the farms in the country so I know what I can do to improve my yield. And perhaps other bundled up stuff like a year supply of cow food or yeah, something like that. Yeah, and link it into my <laughs> combine harvester or whatever it is so that I can yeah. you know, do all this sort of stuff. And, and I'll pay you, you know, 10K a month or whatever for that for service. A, for an end-to-end -end solution. Yeah. Now, how's the mobile operator going to deliver that? Yeah. Now, how could 200 mobile operators around the world all become specialists in agriculture and all deliver an agriculture solution? So what solution? Ericsson says is partnerships. That's what their thing. We, uh, Ray and I went and actually chatted to the CEO a little while back, and Ray was asking him much more pertinent questions. I was just being frivolous and... <laughs> and trying to get him drunk, but, um, but Ray was Not actually. A bad tactic. Well, yes, Ray, Ray was actually being professional and asking proper questions. And uh, yeah, he asked him a, a question about some of this stuff, and and, and Boyer Eckholm sort of stressed this sort of partnership thing, yeah. which which is lovely in principle, but Ericsson itself hasn't got a great track record. And remember the Cisco partnership? Yeah, that just went nowhere. Yeah. So it's, it's all. Uh, oh, oh no, you didn't. Um, so it's all very well doing that but actually making these partnerships happen and you can imagine you know across massive corporations if inform I mean former prefers just buy them like if you're going to do like an informer UBM partnership and trying to say right you've got to play nice with these people who aren't even part of the same company as you you can there's yeah. just enormous resistance yeah Whereas less so if yeah. you just partnerships pony you're not, up and buy you're, you're dividing the revenues then anyway yeah. aren't you so if you just have Accenture coming in and partnering with you on a on an NBIOT service then presumably they're doing all the value-added stuff and you're doing the connectivity thing yeah, why, and why and would if, it be otherwise exactly. I guess. and so. if they're the customer facing side they're going to be yeah. steering the customer yeah. towards the stuff that's most advantageous to them I mean, yeah. it's just human nature isn't it and, and why do you need a partnership you can just go to the operator and buy the connectivity you want in the same but way the, but the point is that, like the, the agricultural analogy so Ericsson's never going to be that good at that no but John Deere is yeah and John Deere's not that good at connectivity but Ericsson is so in principle Ericsson and John Deere I'm not saying this is actually a thing but yeah. I'm speaking Ericsson because yeah. I was talking about get together and and offer everything, but in practice, it doesn't always turn out that way. Does no, it? and I guess you know it depends whether they can just buy it as a sort of standard off the shelf kind of thing. So, you know, yeah, let, let's imagine there is say narrowband IoT coverage rolled out everywhere across the country from Vodafone or similar, and all you have to do is um, place your order on the website for fifty SIM cards and and they arrive and you stick them in the cow tags and put them on the cows. Yeah, then you don't need a partnership. That's just a, a, no. an element that you buy in. But if actually that coverage doesn't exist and you've got sort of a bit bespoke and stuff yeah. needs to be done and you've got to persuade either the operator to put in a base station or you've got to put your own base station in or something, then obviously you need more expertise and then you can imagine some kind of need for a, another so, entity. So it strikes me, I don't know if this rings true to you, Ian, it strikes me as just a sort of wholesale arrangement. So perhaps the best way for um, operators and networking companies to cash in on IoT isn't even necessarily through these partnerships with verticals, but just to create a really robust wholesale arm where we go, whoever you are, if you're John Deere looking to create an IoT solution for agriculture or, or you're sort of a medical or, or whatever vertical, mm -hmm. here's this whole, here are these wholesale <coughs> packages where you just buy a bunch of all the stuff you can't do off us, but then once you've bought that wholesale, you're on your own. Mm. So yeah. Does that make sense to you? Too? I guess, but um, then you in the situation yeah. of it being quite a low margin sort of, yeah. you know, commodity business, aren't you really? And is the likes of, yeah. I mean, yeah. as we just saying, likes of Orange and Deutsche Telekom, they sort of want to be systems integrators and be the yeah. guys who are yeah. stitching all of this together, and they're the kind of uh, central so point that where we all agree it gets to. a bit dicey. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah. so I kind of agree with you. I think. Well, I agree with both of you. I think first of all, that is where they're naturally going to end up. They're, they're fabulously good bit pipes. They hate that word. It sounds sort of yeah. pejorative. It sounds like a bad thing. Yeah. But it's not a bad thing. Someone's got to deliver that. And you're always going to pay for that provision of, of bit transport. But equally, they're always looking for ways to increase their revenue stream. Most mobile operators have seen falling revenues over the years, and they're desperate to reverse that. And the only way they can see to do that is to, to move up the value chain to do more stuff. Yeah. But they've never managed to do it. No. And I just don't see this as being any different, despite, yeah. the, despite the, the, their attempts. So, so the wholesale thing, I'm not, not going to claim it's just a eureka moment, mm. but maybe that's halfway between being completely commoditized, sort of utility, and being this SI, which we're all skeptical they're capable of being. Yeah. Um, maybe a wholesaler is a bit of added value. 
<coughs> um, so you, you know you've got bespoke wholesale packages maybe for certain verticals with perhaps a bit of you know um, middleman stitching you know helping you halfway mm. like one one interesting model I always found from back in the day when I used to write about chips a lot more the arm business model always used to fascinate me because um, apart from arm being a rare example of a UK high-tech success story what what arm does is they design semiconductors but then they license out that design they don't ever make a chip yeah. in principle they never get their hands on a piece of silicon it's people like qualcomm yeah they it? just yeah. they just yeah. make the design and then they go here you go qualcomm you know for an upfront fee and a piece of the action for every chip you sell you got this design so we've done let's say 75 percent of the heavy lifting on the chip design for you you can finish it off i mean that's how apple mm. which we'll get onto in a sec are able to make these a12 bionic chips and all that sort of thing it's mm. all because of arm yeah. yeah and to some extent imagination <coughs> technologies which apple is now trying to kill but that's another matter um so yeah i think that model of doing a lot of the heavy lifting but then handing over to someone like qualcomm that's better at uh, at making an SOC and marketing it and getting it into phones and all that sort of thing. So as soon as it stops being your core competence, it's just I guess finding out yeah. where that cutoff is. Yeah, and I think the I think that's spot on. It's a good example. So uh, Arm actually until quite recently were really quite small. They had just had a few thousand people. They were based out near Cambridge, but in a sort of out of town office. Yeah, the next to a field. I'd be yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, pretty low cost base, and that yeah. meant that when they sold these licensing rights for these cores at you know, a cent each or whatever it was, they sold obviously millions, billions of them, mm -hmm. and and that was a fabulous revenue stream. And I think the same is could be true for the mobile operators, but they're starting from a different place. They've got a yeah. lot of employees. They've got a lot of expensive high street shops. Yeah. They've got snazzy offices in you know, reasonably expensive places. And in a way, they need to kind of re-engineer themselves towards yeah, leaner. a leaner, meaner kind of wholesale bit pipe type of model where they can sort of you know, do the, the EasyJet Ryanair kind of thing to the airline industry. Right. Um, Don't push get the started on Ryanair, mate. No, no. Sensitive subject. Mm. I also lost my holiday. Uh, in fact, I lost my holiday. I saw you I, actually lost it. Did you see? Yeah. Did you see or hear the podcast where I, I did, moaned I about did. my holiday? I did. So I think you, was it, was that the Friday you were travelling? That's right. On I the was on the twenty seventh. I was on the Saturday, and they just cancelled oh a whole load God. of flights out of Stansted, and we couldn't get out to our holiday. So at all. you basically had a, a, an equivalent thing to me. Well, I mean, yeah. the only reason we got holiday is that we went back home and, and bought fresh flights on EasyJet. Yeah. In fact, I just this is a complete tangent. <laughs> um, I just did the claims process um, yeah. with Ryanair, and, and of course. It, it being Ryanair, and I don't even care if they see us and want to sue me, um, they make every step of it as odious and unpleasant yeah, as possible. Yeah, every company, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but Ryanair, I think, has refined that. Other, yeah. other companies look to Ryanair, for, ex for example, <laughs> when it comes to being awkward. And so, for example, on the form, you're only allowed to upload one file. So they're, they're saying, let us know all your expenses. Yeah. It's not like you can upload tons of JPEGs or whatever. Yeah, you've got to you only want one file, so you've got to find some way of... I don't know, copy and paste yeah. it into a Word document. And then there's a there's an upper limit of the file size, which is quite small. And they also say it's got to be legible. So you can tell they're already trying to make it yeah. so that Squeeze the chances it. are you're going to screw <laughs> it up. So let's hope the operators don't go quite that far down that path. Yeah. So that was <laughs> they good. Cut that, out, they cut out costs. That was cathartic quickly. for me. Venting yeah. about that was, was really helpful. Yeah. Well, Thank you. Well, because you're going to go on to the iPhone, aren't you, Zane? But um, I was just going to yeah, chip yeah. in because mm. the, the other element of 5G that, that came up was the mm. low latency yeah. stuff. And, and I've always thought that kind of ties in to some extent with, the, with IoT because it gets associated with things like cars and healthcare. But what, what are your thoughts on... On, on that you know you're a bit yeah. skeptical maybe about IOT being a huge revenue generator and we talked about yeah. mobile broadband but where, where do you see the, the sort so, of low latency stuff at so the nearly all the IOT that, that I see is is very high latency actually so you know your connected cow frankly it doesn't matter if it takes a few minutes for them to upload a, a, a tweet that says my legs hurting or whatever it might be yeah and similarly to pretty much every sensor so actually you're going the opposite way with almost all IOT the stuff that might be low latency, I think, is a very small element of IoT connectivity, and it's probably for the future because it's the more complicated yeah. stuff. Um, I don't buy the car at all, frankly, because my simple take on the car is an autonomous car must <coughs> be able to work without any connectivity yeah. because it's going to go into it's places. Not autonomous, otherwise, it's really not strictly. autonomous. It's going to drive into a tunnel, <coughs> and if it doesn't work without connectivity it'll stop and it'll wait in the tunnel for 10 years until somebody manages to get <laughs> around point. To no but tunnels will be connected well not for 10 years 
how long has it taken to, to do the underground in London? Um, mm. so, you, so it has to work without connectivity. If it works without connectivity, why does it need to be connected? The only reason could be because it works a bit better, but frankly, it has well, to work well enough. Well, part of well it's enough. supposed to be this sort of uh, real-time vehicle-to-vehicle, I yeah. know what that car's going to do so I can take sort of preliminary yeah. action. Or, or communicating with traffic lights and that sort of thing. Yeah, but I don't I don't bundle that into 5G. To me, that's just car-to-car communications. That's yeah. that's a short-range thing. V2X thing. is all the way around. Yeah. The, the, one, the vehicle manufacturers will build into their cars, but right. it has nothing to do with the mobile operators or the mobile industry. It's just direct. This is happening talking. now, isn't it? And it's it? happening this, now. Yeah. There's technologies now for it. VW, I think, have said they're going to build it into all their cars in the right. next few years. And yes, that makes sense. The car in front sending a message back saying, I'm braking really hard, you might want to put your brakes on too, yeah. mm. is all good stuff. But but not what so I would think of Mostly it'll be a, a laser beam, a radar. The, the one I'm yeah. sceptical about, and, and I'm coming at it from a position yeah. partly of ignorance really, but I suppose I'm sceptical because other people have been sceptical, is the healthcare one. Because I'm not entirely sure why if people are in fixed facilities. Yeah that are linked by fiber the, the remote telemetry why are you really so they're in remote sort of, surgery yeah exactly yeah. i don't really oh, see why 5 i've been taking the piss out of for a I while mean, but this is one of the ones that always gets thrown up by the industry whenever it's, they talk it's, about it's just remote latency. surgery yeah remote surgery, it's just brilliant yeah. it reminds me back in the days of, of iridium when there was this lovely advert for polar explorer you know whipping out his iridium phone and making a phone call from some um snow strewn sort of icicle ridden place and you thought you know yeah perfect every polar explorer should have one that means there's probably about 20 <laughs> phones in the world. <laughs> Every remote surgeon might uh, need this. How many are there? But 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 you're yeah. right. If you look at a remote surgery unit and they exist, they're like big enclosed sort of perspex things where you can put your hands into particular devices to get tactical feedback and yeah. immersive head and so on. This is a big bit of kit that probably costs you know upward of 50k. Yeah, you're I not going to say way more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and way more probably. You're not going to put. You're not going to have it in some field somewhere without connectivity. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be in a building yeah. with with wonderful fiber connectivity. Mm. Yeah, and and similarly, the far end, you're hardly likely to have a robotic arm doing heart surgery on someone in a place where there's no connectivity. But I thought it was about the latency. Well, so but you so can the get the latency be good, with fiber. If, yeah, yeah. If you've got a direct fiber connection for that. The latency is mm. not a problem. Then the latency is a problem. So so so. No, that that example is so ludicrous that it sort of begs the question: Couldn't they come up with something even slightly better? Sorry, I just that? thought about something. Uh, what about the U.S. Army would probably like this to have one of those machines on or robotics. site? You know, they have those tents. Oh, the in bomb disposal type of things. No, 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 arms. for surgery. Oh, okay. So you have somebody in the US per- performing surgery on somebody on the field. Again, Possibly. it's not a massive market opportunity. No. Though, is it? <laughs> well, it's a the US Army business. will. Yeah, they're, 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 they're drones that, suppose, but, uh, anyway. Yeah. But, um, I, uh, I had about, I think it was uh, my World Congress before this one, I wrote a piece taking the piss out of 5G over hype. Deja vu, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and one of the examples I used was, was this robotic surgery. Now, I haven't got it in for robotic surgery. It just as you're describing it now, mm. it just struck me as one of those over-utopian things. Mm. And there's this guy, a very nice guy called um, Professor Misha something or other from King's College. Dollar. That's right. Dollar, Misha yeah. Dollar. He's, yeah, yeah. He's, um, who's quite a sort of evangelist for all this yeah. stuff. <laughs> he really took exception. He's like, whoa, Scott, don't take the piss out. Anyway, and I, I met him and wrote up a follow-up piece, but I, you know, he's a bit worried. And I granted, I can use some reasonably unfiltered language yeah. on these things. He was a bit worried that I was trashing the whole concept. But my point was, I was trashing it as an exemplar of why we need 5G. So anyway, yeah, and, and, and Misha, um, you know, has got some interesting cases that he's trying to promote. In particular, he likes the idea of being able to do sort of remote concerts, so different performers yeah. are in different countries, and they can all perform together over a low latency connection. Yeah, I've seen yeah. a demo of that at King's College, and so you can see why you'd need low latency for that. It's but quite again, niche, isn't it's it? It's quite niche. <laughs> you know, is is that sufficient to to justify? massive rollout of this kind of stuff yeah not really is is that just one example of thousands of services that are similar in which case they might aggregate up to something yeah hard to see that at the moment people are sort of struggling to find just the one or two let alone the the, the 500 or the thousand okay we got um with the talking about the iot stuff mm. you're talking about it struck me as that that gives us a little bit of a segue into the iphone thing mm. specifically because the story as I wrote it up about the latest iPhones, and we can talk about the actual hardware in a bit, was the presence of the support for eSIM. Mm. Mm. Now, one of the reasons I thought there was a, an IoT segue, and I might just be barking at the wrong tree, I'm sure, be sure to tell me if I am, um, is, of course, if, if in future um, pretty much all otherwise inert, dumb, um, featureless devices all just come with a little chipping because it's so bloody cheap to do it. 
um, and that and all those chips support eSIM, then you've got the opportunity in principle for just over the air to just activate fleets of IoT devices yeah. without needing any sort of physical intervention or anything like that. Yeah. Do, do you think do you think eSIM could be quite an it, like ubiquitous eSIM could be quite an important enabler of IoT? Absolutely, and in fact, SIM makes no sense for IoT. So you know, SIM stands for Subscriber Identity Module. A thing is not a subscriber. No. And you know, the original idea of a SIM card, of course, was that you might take it out of one phone that you didn't want to use that day because yeah. you wanted to take a different phone out that evening or whatever and plug it into another phone. Now we don't tend to do that, but that was the original concept. It made it transparent to be able to take your identity from one phone right. to another. For a thing, you really don't need that kind of functionality. And actually, it's a right pain because you've got to make sure you've got the right SIM in the right thing. Yeah. Somebody might come and, and take it. And if it's a tiny little module, you haven't even got even a nano SIM. It's exactly. too big, isn't it? So you, so you build all that functionality into the underlying chip. And as you said, that becomes an eSIM kind of thing. So actually, for IoT, the, the assumption has been broadly that, that you would have that sort of oh, eSIM functionality We're not talking right about from the SIM start. Anyway. Right. No. I think it came out of IoT, didn't it? The eSIM idea to, to, to almost. To some degree, okay, yeah. Yeah. I got it kind of wrong, cart before the horse. But, but I think it is revolutionary potentially because it, it starts to make it much, much simpler to switch mobile operator, even yeah. on the fly yeah. as a sort of roaming kind of thing of I've just roamed into an area where my current provider isn't very good, I'll switch to a different one. And that, of course, starts to undermine the current models that the mobile operators have got with their subscribers of sort of exclusivity for, for one or two years. Now, you know, Apple, I think, will be careful not to push that too hard, but it's but it's opening the door for some potentially quite major changes around. Well, you say Apple will be careful not to push it. Is that because you think Apple is going to be careful not to sort of upset operators? Is that? Is That's that my guess. That? I mean, I, I've got no inside knowledge. That was your, wasn't that the the light reading angle was a bit more? It was like you treating the eSIM move as a bit more sort of overtly antagonistic to operators, if I remember seeing that. Um, I don't think it's antagonistic to operators, but I, I see it as... Um, I mean, I spoke to a guy who, who I know called John Fletcher, who's uh, another sort of industry consultant who's worked at um, KPMG in the past, and Analysis Mason, mm. um, and he's... Similar view. It, it it makes it. You could be sitting in the pub and decide that you um you know if you had you had enough of your three account and you want to yeah. move on to Vodafone and you basically download the Vodafone app and then Just do it and then and then you're sort of downloading an e, an e sim. Yeah. Uh, the ir irony is you're doing it over three's network. Yeah. yeah. And then and then you switch operator and it, it sort of commoditizes the operators even more. It makes them. I guess it makes yeah, them even more like utilities, yeah. doesn't it, really? Yeah. It's, they're almost a menu of options exactly. that you can choose. And it to probably makes um, prepaid more attractive as well. Well, he, he said two challenges that he really saw were the roaming issue. So imagine Chinese people traveling to Australia, mm -hmm. you know, the plane lands, you've got Wi-Fi connectivity, and their message comes up, you know, you can download your, your Telstra mm. uh, SIM now yeah. before you get off the, the flight and start using it. Um, and the other the other issue he saw in the short term was it quite a big challenge on the sort of re retail side, retail distribution um, outlets, which operators make quite a lot of investment in. But you've also got the infrastructure around like that, like car phone warehouse. And, mm. um, it's it's even less reason to have to visit these shops. You know, yeah. he, he sort of yeah. described them as mm -hmm. they're not really smart smartphone stores in many cases. They're actually SIM shops. And although you can get your SIM sent through the post now, a lot of people will yeah, go like to those Gift stores to, yeah. to get them set up and installed. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, it's it's quite a bit, it's, a, it's another sort of high street threat, really. Do you ever do that when you're walking down the high street and you walk past a phone shop? I was curious to see how full they are. And I'm wondering what the people are in there talking about. Yeah. I mean, if it's some well, granny going, how you know, SIM oh, how does this work? Then that's <laughs> fine. I can understand that. But... Um, I would have thought for younger generations, the need to go into a shop and look at the phones and chat to people about them is becoming rapidly redundant. You'd think yeah. so, wouldn't you? Yeah. You got. I mean, online channels are an easy way to get your your phones now, and with a move to things like eSIMs, there's even less reason for those stores to be. I think they have to. I think they have to become sort of more sort of experience type places. I mean, Orange is trying to do that. I think in yeah. France to some extent with some of its flagship stores, and, and especially with its move into banking. You go in. I went. I, I was taken into one by Orange in Paris uh, a few months ago, and it's more of a sort of place for you to try out services, and you can set up a bank account, and they're trying to stitch together their whole sort of service mm -hmm. pr proposition in the yeah. store. But mm -hmm. the traditional, as a traditional place to go and get your phone and get your SIM card set up, they've almost, it's mm. almost like they've realized already that 
that will finish yeah, at some point. They have like a fake living years. room and all that stuff. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can sit down and try games out and watch the tennis mm -hmm. on well, 4K and that's whatever, a similar and concept to what we're talking about um, on the B2B side with 5G mm. is sort of moving up the value stack. So yeah. that's for, for the pure B2C side. If they're going to be more than just dumb pipes for consumers, then it's got to be extra services and bits and bobs. Because just you know, just flogging the phones doesn't get you anywhere. I remember years ago when I was a smartphone analyst, um, operators moaning about the amount of money they were having to give Apple even back mm -hmm. then. So, so the the handsets were a loss leader for them to sell the contracts. So they don't particularly enjoy. They sort of pinch their yeah. nose when they sell yeah. you a handset. Um, so yes, yeah, so they get into stuff like sort of smart home or, or whatever, although there are plenty of issues around consumer IoT as well. In fact, we might as well go on that tangent. Mm. Jamie just wrote a piece from IBC today that I put up basically saying that um, smart homes are bollocks. There's lots of things are bollocks at the moment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, but but I think he got that from being in a keynote and so some expert, it wasn't just Jamie's opinion, some expert going, yeah, this is why it's not happening. Do you find there's, there's a similar sort of challenge to on the B2C side with IoT, with them trying to find some kind of added value that people will pay money for? Yes, I think so. Um, you know, they talk a lot, for example, about industrial IoT. That's one of the, the big things. But actually, you know, most factories are perfectly happy out there. If they need connectivity, either yeah. they've got wired systems throughout the factory or they use Wi-Fi or they use Bluetooth. It works yeah. just fine. Um, you know, what is it that, that they're missing that suddenly the mobile operators are going to provide some very unclear, mm. uh, and I think you know, it's a bit like the smart home. You know, it, it's it, you could argue it's a nice to have, but it doesn't really add and that that's, much value. Wi-Fi is the name of the game in the home. Wi-Fi is the name of the I game. Mean, there are certain cool bits of technology like um, mesh Wi-Fi that seems to make some sense yeah. to avoid those little not spots yeah. from Wi-Fi at home. But I mean, most people. That's the other problem mm. that the operators got is most people. When we're when we're in the office, I jump on the guest Wi-Fi here, which I yeah. probably shouldn't do and shouldn't be admitting. Please don't sack me. <laughs> um, and when I'm at home on my Wi-Fi, so the only time I'm ever on, if you know, in my normal working time is is when I'm com commuting, and even then I'll probably uh, load in advance like um, magazines I've subscribed to yeah. or podcasts or whatever. Or I to. I'm not streaming them. Yeah, a bit of Red Dwarf. <laughs> Subscribe to Spectator and The Economist. I can preload them. I just downloaded... Um, you might enjoy this one, uh, Pierre. So we were talking about the Elon Musk, Joe Rogan. Well, Elon Musk's um, co-founder of PayPal, um, mm. Peter Thiel, mm. has just been on Dave Rubin. Mm. And I was just listening to that on the way, and it's really interesting, some of the stuff he's talking about. Well, Elon Musk wasn't the founder of PayPal. He, he, was he joined as the oh, third guy, kind of thing. Oh, he was a pedantic. <laughs> <laughs> third guy. Don't I mean, give him too free. much credit, okay? <laughs> but but I do think you know. I, I agree. I think we're we're getting to a, a point where actually cellular is your fallback connectivity. Mm. Your preference is Wi-Fi because it's fast. It works really well. It's free. It's ostensibly um, free. Yeah. And and actually, you probably spend most most people probably spend most of their days in a position where they can connect to Wi-Fi at home or at work or whatever. And then cellular is what you use when you haven't got Wi-Fi yeah, connectivity. Totally. Um, and you know, that's not something I think the operators would like to really. No, uh, a bit of an uncomfortable position. Yes, for. It's, yeah, they're the fallback. They're the sort of yeah. what you, what you use like when you use something else. What kind of yeah. connectivity can you get on the on the Maersk, like container carrier? I agree. You like a big a big container ship. Yeah. Uh, absolutely no idea. Do you have any well, idea? satellite? So, no? Yeah. So so yeah. typically, what happens there is yeah, absolutely once you're at sea, your only option is satellite. If you're mm, more yeah. than say 30 or 40 miles away from the coastline then you've got no other option and satellites are actually not bad for that kind of thing because there aren't that many ships at sea and the satellite capacity is quite high so typically if you're if you're trying to track a container and it's got some kind of connectivity it's probably got a short range system that kind of aggregates up to a node on the ship that talks to all the containers and then that links back to the ship's satellite system which can then transmit it and so those few kilobytes are probably quite expensive then they, they're moderately expensive yeah, yeah. so you know, that's why you probably don't, unless you really have to track every container every inch of its way. It's more, it's typically mm. enough to know that it's following it every bit of the yeah. Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and, and why do you need to? So you know, if you tr if you track it at the port, at the port, this container passed yeah. through Felixstowe at two p.m. on this date, and it got put on that ship. Yeah, I know where that ship is. Therefore, I know where that container is, unless it's fallen off by now in the sea. Yeah, which um, is another matter. Yeah, and then <laughs> when it docks in, you know, Rotterdam or whatever, you yeah. track it as it goes. And through then the if port it doesn't again, turn up, then you get then on the phone and go, "What's going on?" What if on? the yeah. the captain wants to share a selfie on on the deck? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, or be like, do you remember that, that Italian guy who just ran the ship oh aground because he was showing off? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, uh, we're running out of time. Um, the uh, iPhone, so the actual iPhone announcement, mm. might, as, might as well refer to that mm. as that's always a big device announcement of the year. So the announcement was they, they launched the X last year. Now they're going all in on the X. So they've got the XS. So typically what Apple does in alternate years, it has like a a redesign and then in, in the immediate year after it just kind of tweaks the redesign yeah. it's a little bit a like sort of bump. Intel's yeah, yeah a bit like Intel's TikTok cadence for its chips the redesign is a tweak in the first place it's a tweak well that, a tweak. It, yeah, it's debatable how, how fundamental a redesign is but that's been but it costs a lot more well, and that's also been uh, one thing I will say. Not no, that Apple needs me to. They haven't raised their price. Well, it's up to one thousand four hundred and ninety-nine. Oh, I mean, if you, you go, yeah. if you go up to that's yeah. if you go uh, five hundred and twelve gig yeah. storage sure, on, that's the, on the, the super price. max. It was yeah. what before one thousand one hundred. Yeah. So with taxes, it's raising your top with price taxes, a lot. We've crossed Fair enough. The bar. No, I, I imagine the most expensive spec ones, the plus with all with as much storage as you get, would still be in about one two or something last year. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they've also jumped. I mean, I think it's remarkable that you can get half a terabyte of storage in a phone now. That's crazy, it's yeah. bizarre. Yes, it's um, a testimony to how these things evolve. Isn't I it? remember when the first like sort of half terabyte hard drive came out, and that seemed pretty big. Yeah, and that's something that's about this size mm. for for radio listeners. But I, I think the. Uh, I mean, if you talk to smartphone analysts, yeah. they're all quite sort of grumpy and downbeat at trade shows these days yeah. because there's basically no innovation happening in but that But it's been area. the case for about a decade. Uh, for a, a decade? I'd say so. I'd I mean, a decade's when the first iPhone came out. Yeah. Yeah. Right, perhaps so, a slight yeah. exaggeration. Uh, but but I it's mean, been that for a couple of years, certainly. There's been a couple of industrial design tweaks by the iPhone. Yeah. But basically, the, the basic industrial design of the smartphone topped out very early at the black rectangle. Black yeah. touchscreen rectangle. Yeah. We don't have things like sliders or clamshells or anything like that. No, anymore. but um, it, but but it's not about. I mean, I think the form factor was perfect, more or yeah. less, when it first was mm. was done in two thousand and seven. It's about the uh, some of the software improvements that we're seeing aren't very significant now. Right. It's, it's um, you know people used to get very enthusiastic about those sort of things back in 2012, 2013. But and, hasn't and that just topped out as well? Is it a, exactly. a limited amount? But this ties they in with do. the whole eSIM thing. That if people are going to, we see more and more people going on to SIM only deals. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, upgrade cycles aren't happening as often. Yeah. If you're going to stick with your phone and, and then it's not locked anymore and you you have the flexibility to change and all of a sudden eSIMs are, are, are sort of widely available, then it's even more reason to yeah. To I take agree. I agree. It's a real and, problem. I agree. It's um, a real problem for smartphone makers. I just don't necessarily and operators by, by and default. operators. I, I just don't necessarily sympathise with people who get grumpy about it because I don't think it's for lack of trying. It's not like they just gone sod it. That'll do. No. Well, I think mm. they're grumpy because they don't have um, they don't have something to to, to yeah. write about. Well, there we go. <laughs> I mean, from a nice to point of view, you could argue. The phone's pretty perfect, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, is a, this is a stunning device that you can pull out of your pocket and you can access any bit of information yeah. anywhere in the world instantly. The only thing you might whinge about is the battery life, typically, but yeah, yeah. by and large, it's... it's but I guess it's, it's looking for the next growth opportunity, isn't it? Because yeah. people are just going to stick with their phones. Well, it was because screen at some real point estate. Go, I mean, Pierre's going to go off and buy the XS. No, the not. average man on the street is going <laughs> to say, I'm happy with Never. my iPhone 8. Uh, you know, I didn't really see the need to get the X. And all of a sudden, these device makers need they need a wearable or something that's going to change the game again and yeah. we haven't seen that happening no, no, and I think I mean, it's you know we, we saw the similar sort of thing in the computing industry so for a long time you had to replace your computer every two to three years because it just became so out of date in that time that it wouldn't run any software or anything like that yeah. now you can keep it for you know, five years or more as long as you don't break it and we saw of course that precipitate all sorts of problems you know Compaq and companies like that just completely yeah, crashed out of the industry yeah. um, <clears throat> and the whole thing sort of changed around a bit and you know, maybe that's the sort of thing we're gradually seeing in the smartphone space although there aren't that many yeah. major manufacturers left anymore anyway but it does feel like a time of, of, of change towards a more stable kind of environment. We're, we're maximising the screen real estate. Yeah, now. so Apple, Apple's, no Apple's good at that except for the, the notch yeah, which everyone seems to have got over. Everyone's doing a notch now. The Pixel everyone's, 3 yeah. has a notch. Yeah. So, so last year. <laughs> but anyway, just so, so to summarise what they did, they announced this XS, which is a bit better than the X. Um, it's got this A12 chip, which that's is a it. bit better than the A11 that's chip. It. Yeah, pretty much. No, seriously, that's it. Yeah, and <laughs> then the eSIM support. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and there's an XS Max as well, yeah? Which is, yeah, and yes, there's the Max, which is... Which which biggest is screen ever. Is, yeah, so I think the XS is about 5.8 inches, the Max is 6.5 inches. It's getting up to yeah. just silliness. It's a phablet. Yeah. It's a phablet, yeah. The yeah. iPad the mini is 7.9. And then, <laughs> And then you had... And then you had the XR, which is so. So if the XS starts at a grand and the Max starts at a grand one thousand one hundred and fifty, I think, 
And that, there's a really annoying thing that mm. Apple does. They charge you exactly the same in pounds as you do in dollars. So it costs a thousand dollars in the states and a thousand pounds. That's because in of the Brexit, UK. right? Yeah, <laughs> it's Brexit's fault. The pounds. I think you'll find they were doing that pre-Brexit. <laughs> Yeah. So less of that, no, that's please. Not even this kind yeah. of worms. Less of that, it's you remote. Pounds value. <laughs> <laughs> that's the pounds value. Um, but no, but the pounds one point three, mate. Yeah, but it's everything it's you got to say, I've got, a, I've got a rebuttal for. So just yeah, but you know, over. it's it's a grand. But then it's, admit it's, you that lost. doesn't include taxes. It's, it's recovered a bit in the last few days. The after Barnier the said, pound. yeah, we can get a deal done. In All these prices that you said are without taxes. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm saying on Apple's press release, they're saying it costs a grand in terms of dollars and a grand in terms of pounds, yeah. right? Before tax. So just shut up. It's before tax. Yeah, in both cases. So I don't really see. No, what the point iPhone you're here is a thousand pounds after tax. The, oh, I the, see. The level of debate has dwindled. Yeah, so, right. the yeah, I'm bored. <laughs> so the point I was going to make. So the XR comes in at 750. <laughs> That's the cool one. Yeah. Um, and it's still got an A12 chip in it. It's got a slightly lower. Um, Resolution screen, LCD instead of OLED, and L- LCD instead of OLED. Good spot. Yeah. You're, you're, you're allowed back. You're back in my good he graces. Knows all the specs, so. um, but it's not even HD. That's the shocking thing. You cannot watch full HD videos on this. Well, that's shocking. I mean, in that's t- a first world problem for eight hundred eight hundred dollar phone. That's crazy. Yeah, but anyway, there we are, uh, and and they've got that. But they've got that delicate balancing act. If they came in with one that only costs four hundred quid, then who the hell would spend a grand? Mm-hmm. Um, so they've always got that problem. Mm. So that's. I think we're running out of time. There's one more thing I would say. I had a little segue earlier, but I missed the boat. You talked about lean and mean, mm. and uh, you must be pretty lean and mean. Because <laughs> what have you? What have you just been doing on your bike? So I've just completed something that's called the Sant Coles Challenge, which translates to the Hundred Mountain Pass Challenge. Which damn is is it literally that? It's literally that. A hundred mountain passes in ten days. This was in the Pyrenees. Um, 10 so, mountain passes a day yeah so each day is about 130 miles distance and about 18,000 feet of ascent so that's about 60% of the height of Everest from sea level or Good God. or about 7 Snowdens um, so what, what's that, wrong with you <laughs> yeah I think that's a question I asked myself quite a lot actually when, yeah, really when I was out doing about, it I know you like I think when you were on a year ago you were talking about how you cycle in from Cambridge and all that sort yeah. of thing but that's pretty flat this, yes, this, this sounds masochistic. William. This wasn't flat to be. Yeah. yeah, absolutely not. No, it's 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 pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like doing a marathon in a way. It's kind of the sort of thing that once you're running it, you sort of probably think to yourself, "Why the hell am I doing this?" Well, but it's just what you're into. One of the things you're into is cycling, yeah, and, and you're and, just choosing to take yeah. it to the max. Yeah, and I take it to the max with a fully instrumented bike with no VO2 less than max. six, <laughs> yes, six IoT devices, which actually could tell me my VO2 max as I was cycling oh, along. What was it? Um, Sixty-six. What is this thing? VO2 max. Well, I think so like Lance Armstrong was your like... your body processes oxygen, basically. Yeah. Is it? What, what was Lance Armstrong? Like 92 or something? Something like that, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so yes, my bike is an IoT fest of, of sensors and devices. But you did it without any performance-enhancing drugs. Well... <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, a lot I of, went there again. A, a lot of caffeine and some energy drink that's right. called Extreme, we, which we I'll leave you to. So is it in the handles or something? The, all the Did sensors. You grab the handles. Yeah. No. So, so there's a there's a power meter in the crankshaft that measures the wattage that you produce. Mm. I wear a heart rate monitor around my chest, uh, and then there's a sensor that measures the rotation of the pedals, the speed of rotation of the pedals, the speed of rotation of the wheels. Feeds that all to a, a little sort of sat navy kind of unit on the handlebars, which then links to your mobile phone, which can then connect you back to the to the real world. So it's, right. It's uh, and that's not unusual. That's not me kind of being super geeky. That's actually just that's just normal if you're normal. But, normal, normal like, I mean, I would like do. I don't need a bunch of sensors to tell me I'm. F- <laughs> no, and I didn't either. There was a few occasions where, in fact, I wish I didn't have them because I sort of looked down, and and the power said basically you've got no power. And then right. I got to the end of the day, and the, and this little unit said, "You should take sixty-eight hours before you ride again." And I had to like seven hours before the next morning. Wow. Um, Scott, I think Scott only needs like an emoji telling yeah. him how <laughs> yeah. it feels. I just need a sick bag. <laughs> um, and then the next morning it said, "Your recovery, your sick bag's full. <laughs> your, your recovery is poor. You should stop riding." And I, and I was yeah. just waiting for it to say, "Look, I'm going to shut down now because you're clearly ignoring every of my instructions." <laughs> so that, that is that is a funny that is a funny thing actually. The health trackers. We were talking about this a little bit earlier because Apple also announced its latest it um, watch and. And my colleague Wei wrote a story about it's got a certain degree of approval as a heart rate monitor, yeah. but it's still at a very, but it's mm. still at quite mm. a very rudimentary mm. level. And they've got to put all these little disclaimers mm. going. Look, this might not mean anything. Go yeah. to a doctor if you're worried, sort of thing. But um, but yeah, those those sort of uh, 
health tracker things like for, mm. so for someone like you you must be incredibly fit to be able to do this stuff and you've got the the sensor saying steady on William you're killing yeah. yourself son and you're going no I'm all right yeah so do you think you know is that what why is there a disconnect between what you think you're capable of and what this health tracker says you should be doing probably because I'm crazy <laughs> it was probably so? <laughs> it's just not calibrated for nutters for like nutters you. like me <laughs> um but I think it does raise I think you raise a, a really good point which is kind of uh, to to um, what we see with sort of Matt Hancock appearing at um, NHS and saying this is ripe for all sorts of new high techery, yeah. Um, and I think that's that's broadly correct. That actually, there's an awful lot you can do in terms of monitoring people to help them stay out of hospital. To you know, if you're prone to some kind of condition, to monitoring it to see if that happens and so on. Uh, and that would seem to be a huge advance. Yeah. And yeah, there's a downside. That, and chronic management, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. now you're going to get some hypochondriacs who buy all this stuff and then deduce that they're about to die instantly true. when they're when they're fine. It went bleep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the NHS and others start worrying about that. Uh, and my take is you just have to get through that pain and you have to find right. a way to manage that. But actually, it would seem so much more sensible to have this kind of stuff available and so. to be able to make automated diagnosis of people uh, you know, and, yeah. and build on it in the future and use AI and other things in, in the longer term to, to make it work really well rather than just throw your hands up in horror and say, oh my God, we're going to get lots of people coming to hospital because their heart rate monitor says they've got some kind of issue and they haven't really got it. Totally. And no, and I think for, for managing, I think that's been, that's been the case for a while. You can see how managing, remotely managing chronic stuff um, you know, we got this aging population. We got yeah. things like diabetes or or whatever um, that just require that don't require you to sit in a doctor's office and for him to go, yeah, take two of these a yeah. day. That could all be done remotely. And there's Absolutely. lots of efficiencies you could get in there before we got to get into the crazy utopian robot arms, yeah. sort of giving you an appendectomy. Yeah, did, did you see that, that can be done now though, can't it? A lot of that stuff. It's not a technology. Yeah, issue, they can get really. better it's at it. A, I mean, yeah, look at the it's NHS. It's not great at IT, is it? Yeah, but it's more of a business problem, isn't it, really? And Fair a funding, and a yeah, funding yeah. issue. Fair point. I, a... I think it's, it's partly that, and often the issue is that the, the parts of the NHS or the system that benefit from, let's say, you spending less time in hospital aren't the parts that have to fund it because that comes out of the GP's budget or whatever. So yeah. so there's all those kind of issues that go on. Uh, I think as well that you know, it's a really tricky environment to bring stuff into. So most, you know, a lot of the patients are elderly, that's where you see more illness, of course, yeah. or they may have some kind of you know, mental health problems or whatever. So they're really tough people to be early adopters of, of any kind of new tech. You just need an app that just pull yourself together when you yeah. turn it on. There we go. So, Job so, done. so it is a difficult place to introduce new stuff, but that shouldn't be an excuse for, for not doing it. Yeah. But, but sadly, the, the history of um, IT in the NHS is a, yeah. a pretty dire one, unfortunately. Right, I think we're out of time. Um, thanks a lot for that, William. Great having you here again. It's Make always sure good to be come here. Back. Yeah. You're always welcome. Thank you. Cheers. And uh, are you cycling home? No. Um, <laughs> but I will go out cycling tomorrow morning. Okay, of course. See if my legs no still work. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening and make sure you join us for the next one.